Welcome to Washington Talk, I'm Eun Jung Cho. Amid stalled nuclear talks, North Korea is escalating pressure on the U.S. and South Korea. It conducted four rounds of missile tests in two weeks, denounced joint military drills, and threatened to take a new road. What strategic choice will America make? We are hopeful that in the coming weeks we'll get back to the negotiating table to achieve that. In the studio with me today, Ms. Jenny Town, fellow at the Stimson Center. Ms. Town is also the managing editor of the 38 North, a website providing policy and technical analysis on North Korea. Also joining me, Mr. Scott Snyder, director of U.S.-Korea policy program at the Council on Foreign Relations. His latest book, South Korea at the Crossroads, charts the evolution of South Korean foreign policy and strategic choices. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, Scott, let me begin with you. So um, with the flurry of missile testings, we detect a slight change in the tone coming from the U.S. officials. Um, Defense Secretary Mark Esper says that North Korea is a grave threat. National Security Advisor John Bolton says that President Trump is watching very, very carefully. So is Washington currently sending a toned down warning to North Korea? I do think that we're seeing a very gradual rationing up uh, of expressions of concern about what North Korea is doing with its missile testing. Uh, but we really haven't seen a limit uh, defined uh, by the United States uh, in terms of these statements. Uh, and this probably uh, reflects the fact that uh, President Trump wants to keep North Korea in the win column uh, in terms of his own political perceptions of his uh, foreign policy. Uh, and it also probably reflects the likelihood that the U.S. still really wants to get back to the, the negotiation track. But I think that where we're really seeing some wear and tear in terms of these tests uh, is in the congressional re reaction. And so, for instance, Senator Markey uh, gave a statement suggesting that uh, Trump was giving a green light to this kind of testing and tried to send a much firmer signal of a limit. And the problem there uh, is that as these tests go on, uh, it undermines uh, the um, uh, expectation for a successful outcome to negotiations, especially on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. So, Jenny, as Scott just pointed out, there are criticisms regarding President Trump um, dismissing North Korean missile testings. So, is North Korea's um, missile testings um, challenging and putting strains on uh, U.S.'s lenient approach to North Korea? I think it's definitely trying the patience of the administration. And I think the, the U.S. administration has tried very hard to keep the door open to negotiations. Um, and this kind of behavior is not helpful. Um, but it's also not helpful that when the first test happened, the precedent was set that this was not a big deal, that it was OK to go ahead and do this as long as it wasn't the long-range missile testing. And so this messaging has really now become problematic in trying to figure out where those limits are, as Scott said, is that we just don't know where that line is, that if they cross it, they're going to move forward, other than if they do long-range testing. And so it has basically greenlit um, North Korea to do these kind of lower level provocations, um, which put a lot of strain also on alliance relations, because I'm sure those in, in South Korea are really trying to figure out what does this mean for their defenses and how much does the U.S. care. Mm -hmm. So if any one of you, is it fair to say U.S. is currently facing a dilemma between trying to keep diplomacy alive and trying to stop North Korea from these provocations? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily a dilemma, but uh, I think that it's clear that uh, the U.S. wants to keep diplomacy alive. Um, uh, there is an effort to try to find a way to define a limit. Uh, in some ways, it reflects the tension between Trump's political view uh, and the objective of the U.S. government to try to achieve a fully uh, verified denuclearization uh, goal. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And Jenny, um, CNN reports that uh, President Trump um, is soured on South Korea because he believes South Korea should rein in North Korea and stop North Korea from doing those missile testings. And he believes that South Korea hasn't delivered much. Um, do you think there was more room that South Korea could have done? I think it's a pretty ridiculous notion um, that Trump thinks that President Moon could control Kim Jong-un and could control this kind of behavior, especially when we've basically tied his hands. Um, you know, in the inter-Korean accords, Korea has, South Korea has already made commitments to North Korea that it certainly can't keep, it can't deliver on because it doesn't have the cooperation of the U.S. So, you know, this includes economic cooperation, this includes the peace agenda. And so unless we're willing to empower South Korea to move forward um, with an agenda that would help build leverage for South Korea, the expectation for them to now go in and, and try and convince Kim Jong-un of, of a path that's more conducive to U.S. ROK interests is, is really kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now, Scott, what do you make of uh, President Trump's expectations in South Korea's role? Because President Moon wanted to be the mediator and the facilitator between Pyongyang and Washington. Well, I, I worry about this a little bit because I think that uh, the initial kind of bargain uh, in the relationship between Mump and, uh, Trump and Moon uh, was one in which uh, Moon was going to deliver uh, North Korea as a big diplomatic success for Trump. Uh, and yet what has happened is that after the initial um, kind of uh, um, intermediary role, uh, North Korea has been trying to marginalize South Korea. Uh, and so this is now having an impact in terms of the U.S.-South Korea relationship because uh, the transactional basis upon which uh, Moon and Trump had a positive relationship is being eroded and President Trump is introducing other issues like burden sharing uh, that uh, are potentially very dangerous for uh, the foundations of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, South Korea's reactions to the missile testings has also been muted and South Korea's national security advisor Chong Yi Young says that the missile testings are not in violation of the 2018 Comprehensive Military Agreement. Do you agree? I think it's a very fine line and I think there's a lot of room for interpretation within both the Inter-Korean Accords and that military agreement and the problem is is that we haven't had a formal agreement with North Korea, either the U.S. or South Korea, that defines, um, you know, what is a suitable parameter of a, of a freeze for freeze sort of arrangement or um, specifics on military exercises and, and these kinds of provocations. And so I think, you know, obviously South Korea wants to keep the door open to diplomacy as well. They have a lot invested in this. Um, it is a very kind of political take, but it, it reminds me a little bit also of when um, North Korea started to refurbish the facilities at Sohei Satellite Launching Station, where they had um, committed the dismantlement of those facilities in the, in the Pyongyang Declaration last September, and then reversed it when they felt like they weren't getting any progress on the rest of the agenda. Um, South Korea has not yet called that a violation, and I think they're still keeping the door open to if the agenda can get back on track, that most likely it will go back in that direction. Um, but you have to wonder how much patience um, South Korea can really have with this kind of antagonism from North Korea. I, I agree that this is a violation of the spirit rather than the letter of the comprehensive military agreement. Uh, and, and of course the North Koreans I think are showing their concern about uh, U.S. ROK conventional dominance on the peninsula by trying to build a greater conventional capacity. And so I think that's actually what's really interesting is that the North Koreans having made progress on their nuclear capability are now turning to the conventional deterrent because they realize that they're still vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we may see continued efforts of this sort uh, by North Korea. Uh, and uh, it complicates uh, the challenge because the comprehensive military agreement was supposed to open the door to tension reduction, and yet we are beginning to see that it's not having the desired effect. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, we're now looking at North Korean intentions, and North Korea still left room, the door open for future diplomacy with the United States. So how can we connect North Korea's recent missile testings with its desire to engage with the United States? Well, I think they've been very careful not to cross what they see as Trump's threshold um, for provocations in terms of the missile testing. They've stuck to short-range ballistic missile testing, knowing if they violate this moratorium on long-range testing that the diplomatic process with the U.S. is likely over. Um, 
But, you know, I, I think part of this is a reminder that what's at stake of that North Korea does continue to advance its capabilities as long as there isn't an agreement in place and that it helps build leverage. And I think the North Koreans feel it helps build leverage for them in negotiations and trying to get back to the table with the U.S. Mm -hmm. And Scott, North Korea continues to threaten that it may take a new road. So what the new road would look like? And is this only an empty, um, exaggerated threat? No, I think it's a real threat. The problem is that the new road is actually the old road. Uh, it's North Korea going back to uh, provocations. It's going back to art autarky and isolation. Uh, and it's really abandoning uh, a pathway that would help integrate North Korea uh, into the region. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is really problematic because we have seen uh, the evolution over decades of North Korea's capabilities uh, and really the uh, expansion of uh, the problems related to North Korea. Uh, and we don't want North Korea to get back onto that track. And I think that's what North Korea is threatening when they talk about a new road. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, Secretary Pompeo remains optimistic and he says that um, working level talks with North Korea would likely resume in a couple of weeks. So do you see any room for um, negotiations and future diplomacy with the United States and North Korea? I, I do think that, again, the door is still open. Um, North Korea has not gone ahead with um, nuclear testing, has not gone ahead with long-range testing. It's certainly trying everyone's patience with the short-range ballistic missile testing. Um, obviously, you know, I, I don't think you're going to get working level talks while military exercises are going on, so it will be after that time frame. Um, I think the U.S. has to be very careful in its messaging going forward as to, you know, what's really going to bring um, North Korea back to the table and I think that's really the question is does North Korea really know what it wants right now has it really chosen its team yet and we haven't seen that are they still recalibrating um, because the, the the meeting in Panmunjom was was kind of rushed for them they didn't seem to be ready um, to move forward that quickly um, but certainly I think they're, they're gearing up for this mm -hmm. um, what they come back to the table and ask for will be very interesting um, but you know the last thing we need is for the rhetoric to really ratchet up with these um, ballistic missile tests that would make it harder to get back to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, before we wrap up this discussion, um, I want both your opinions. So, Scott, um, there is a current uh, heated debate in South Korea over whether to withdraw from Jusovia. Um, is this only a bilateral issue between South Korea and Japan? And what would be U.S. reaction if South Korea go ahead with the withdrawal? It's not a bilateral issue. Uh, Secretary of Defense Esper has expressed his uh, preference that North Korea not abandon Jisomia. Uh, at the same time, it wouldn't uh, hurt the U.S. because the U.S. has bilateral intelligence sharing agreements with both South Korea uh, and Japan. Uh, and so we wouldn't lose. Uh, I think that uh, Japan and South Korea respectively would lose the opportunity to benefit from each other's uh, intelligence collection. Uh, and so, you know, this is a, a negative step. Uh, it is a potential step uh, that uh, undermines the assumption uh, that the U.S. has in terms of its own security strategy that we have allies in South Korea and J Japan, respectively, that are going to be on the same page. I, I think it's really part of a greater push for trilateral cooperation and cooperative security, um, collective security. I think the problem becomes, you know, obviously in the in the recent um, exchanges between Japan and South Korea, is that the U.S. would prefer a collective security arrangement in an area where there is no agreement on collective security. So this was something that the U.S. had really pushed for to increase that trilateral cooperation um, to everyone's benefit, um, but it may be. Uh, a little bit over, overly optimistic of what can actually be accomplished in that process. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll leave our discussion here and watch video for our next topic. Clearly, as we often state every time we talk about it, sanctions will remain in effect until we uh, believe, all parties believe that we have reached that goal.
The U.S. Customs and Border Protection announced foreigners who visited North Korea since March 2011 will no longer be eligible for 90-day visa-free entry into the U.S. Some 37,000 South Koreans are estimated to be impacted by the new rules. Now, Jenny, is, do you think this is a kind of a secondary sanction on North Korea? Is this tightening the news on North Korea's tourism industry? It's certainly possible that that's one of the underpinnings of this. Um, but I, I do think it's part of a larger mandate on immigration. Um, you know, certainly it, there is a mandate that says that um, that the visa waiver would be canceled for, I think it's Iran, Syria, and everyone that was on the SS, the state sponsors of terrorism list. So when North Korea was relisted on that list, it was supposed to go in effect then. It's interesting that there's been this 20 month delay um, in implementation, and it's hard to see how they would actually, um, actually uh, enforce this, given how difficult it is to track people's movements um, going to North Korea unless it's self-reporting. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily um, a secondary sanction and, and necessarily targeted specifically to um, North Korea's tourism industry. Mm -hmm. Do you see a parallel with the secondary financial sanctions? I, I do. I think that uh, what the United States is doing is to underscore and actually personalize the idea that there's reputational risk associated with dealing with North Korea. Uh, and that there might also be tangible costs in terms of a uh, little bit more difficulty in terms of coming to the United States. So basically the administration is trying to force a choice uh, at an individual level between do I want to go to North Korea or do I want to go to the United States. Mm -hmm. So Scott just mentioned, do I want to go to North Korea, do I want to United States? And South Korean media says, of course, they want to go to United States. So this would inevitably, do you think, would deter inter-Korean economic cooperation at Kaesong Industrial Complex? I mean, it could. At the same time, like the, the decision to do this, again, is part of the relisting of the state sponsors of terrorism. Putting them on the list is what, what made this happen, not necessarily um, specific action from North Korea in recent years. Uh, the, it's interesting that it's um, retroactive all the way back to 2011. It will have implications um, for future inter-Korean economic cooperation, but it's not denying entry of people who have been to North Korea to the U.S. It just requires them to get a visa in order to do it. Mm -hmm. And talking about inter-Korean economic cooperation, South Korean President Moon Jae-in called for peace economy to overcome Japan's um, economic e export restrictions on South Korea. Is this a very feasible plan? I don't think so. I think there are two major obstacles to building a kind of peace economy between the two Koreas. Uh, one is the UN Security Council resolutions, which essentially require North Korea to be on a path to denuclearization in order to be delisted. Uh, and, and the second one um, is evidence that peaceful coexistence is being established between the two Koreas. Mm -hmm. And so those two obstacles uh, really have to be overcome before we can imagine that there's going to be an inter-Korean peace economy. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the peace economy concept? You know, I, I think it's wrong to frame it as an answer to um, the, the Japanese sanctions and, and reducing dependence on Japanese products and, and components um, because it sort of assumes that there's a short-term payoff to doing this. And as Scott said, there's a lot of obstacles in order to even get started, much less get profits. And on top of that, you know, it's going to take incredible investment from South Korea to even build the infrastructure to be able to do some of the economic cooperation that they want to do. I, I think it's also, you know, this idea that they're going to have this big benefit from a peace economy um, distracts also from the conversation that needs to happen of, of how to make Korea, South Korea's economy better um, and really adapt to the maturing economy that it is instead of looking to you know, um, cooperation with North Korea as sort of this, this will fix everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Scott, the day after South Korean President Moon Jae-in called for a peace economy, North Korea shot missiles. And apparently North Korea is not interested in economic cooperation with South Korea. When do you think North Korea started cutting North, South Korea out from the diplomacy? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question because as we look back over the last year, uh, we saw the Pyongyang Declaration and there was a lot of euphoria attached to that. And there was an expectation that Kim Jong-un was going to visit Seoul, and that didn't happen. And so I think that might have been the start. Uh, but we didn't really hear the North Koreans start to voice frustration with North Korea publicly. Uh, North Koreans voiced frustration with South Korea publicly until after the failure of the Hanoi summit. 
And I think that what is interesting about that is that in some way it means that the North Koreans might have expected South Korea to do more to bridge that gap. Uh, and so, in a way, uh, Kim Jong-un and Trump uh, both have the same disappointments with regards to the expectations for South Korea's role uh, as a bridge between uh, Washington and Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, um, U.S. Treasury um, sanctioned a North Korean official after the missile testing for his um, evasion of sanctions. And the latest new travel rules are, have indirect impact on the North Korean economy as well. So what do you make of these um, continued U.S. administration actions to put pressure on North Korea? Well, you know, it, it goes back to this premise. The U.S. really believes that it can be in negotiations and still um, trying to create more leverage over North Korea. And it's not something that the North Koreans have ever responded well to. <laughs> um, in general, it's been rather antagonistic to the relationship, and oftentimes it has derailed um, the negotiations while it's trying to build pressure. And I think this, this notion keeps coming up of, you know, North Korea at the beginning of the process felt that they were taking some important unilateral steps to build confidence, to build the env environment for um, negotiations in the U.S. while they did suspend large-scale military exercises temporarily, um, you know, they continued to impose sanctions. They continued to, they renewed the travel ban. They cut off humanitarian assistance to the North. And so when North Korea is looking at this, they're looking at this is not a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. This is the old approach, the old relationship. And I think it really makes them question, can we really have a different relationship? Mm -hmm. Scott, do you think U.S. should still hold on to the sanctions leverage against North Korea, which continues to make provocations? I think that the United States will continue to hold on to sanctions leverage and may even try to uh, build greater uh, sanctions in order to obtain more leverage to basically force North Korea to move in the direction of denuclearization. And where this becomes a problem, I think, is that, I mean, there are two forms of, uh, two ways of inducing self-restraint. Uh, on North Korea's part. Uh, one is through coercion, uh, and we've seen a lot of that. Uh, but the other uh, opportunity that maybe we're just starting to miss is to induce self-restraint through reciprocal unilateral measures. And as Jenny suggested, the North Koreans did send some signals that they were interested in showing self-restraint by taking their own steps to reduce actions. And now they may perceive that the U.S. is not reciprocating. Um, and I think that it just illustrates uh, the magnitude of mutual distrust uh, and the incredible difficulty that we're going to have in trying to close that gap. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have to leave it here and now move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment, time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. Today, it's North Korea's recently released stamp featuring President Trump and Chairman Kim marking their meeting at the demilitarized zone. The stamp shows an image of the two leaders standing in front of the inter-Korean border. President Moon, who was also at the DMZ together, was not included in the stamp. In June, North Korea also issued stamps celebrating the first anniversary of the Singapore summit. Scott? You know, it's very interesting. I think the North Korean issuance of stamps is almost like a pictorial national narrative for what North Korea thinks is important. Uh, and so clearly they think the meeting with Trump was important, but uh, we all know that there have also been stamps uh, commemorating successes on missile launches. Uh, and so I think that we have to, uh, when we examine our stamp collection, we have to take it uh, in its totality mm -hmm. in order to understand uh, what North Korea is emphasizing and where it's going. Mm -hmm. Jenny? I, I would agree. I, I would add, I think it would be weird if President Moon was in the picture because this really was a bilateral meeting. It wasn't a trilateral meeting, even though Moon was there for a quick photo op. It was not a trilateral consultation. Mm. Um, you know, I think it does also show that North Korea does value the diplomatic process and is trying to sell the diplomatic process domestically. Um, but, you know, at some point, they need to start showing results as well as to why they've engaged in this, why they've engaged in the, a narrative of denuclearization. And so far, um, I think they have very little to show for their efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Scott, Jenny, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And this was Washington Talk from the Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. Join us next week for more analysis on North Korea.